uh, finite dimensional first class uh, constraint Hamiltonian systems and turned to the canonical description of general relativity, which of course is a starting point for any uh, canonical quantization. Um, I pointed out that in order to uh, define conjugate momenta, one of course always has first made implicitly often uh, a choice of, uh, of a notion of time. And uh, that will take on a, a somewhat new a spirit when we come to general relativity because there is no a priori physically distinguished notion of time. And we'll see how this plays out uh, in the general uh, formalism. Now, I'll just start by writing down a few expressions that were uh, uh, on the blackboard uh, yesterday. So first, just recall, we made a transition from four-dimensional uh, configuration uh, field variables, g mu nu of x, the Lorentzian matrix, to a bunch of quantities that are more adapted to a, a hypersurface slicing. And I'm seeing here on the board that you've learned about this today in all generality. Now, we just need it for co-dimension one. Uh, a slicings where, you know, I'd introduced to you kind of a three-dimensional metrics. So they are induced on spatial uh, hypersurfaces. And then these additional data whose geometric uh, meaning we had also uh, understood uh, yesterday in terms of this splitting. This is, of course, a positive definite. Romanian uh, uh, metric, uh, three by three. Um, uh, and uh, we had also uh, looked at the associated um, velocity variables, which were given by the extrinsic curvatures. And we'd also briefly recapped their geometric uh, uh, interpretation. And then made a Legendre transformation That just means expressing everything in terms of uh, expressing the action in terms of um, coordinates and momenta. The coordinates were these HIJs, and they were uh, supplemented by a, a, a bunch of canonically conjugate momenta, which are called little pi uh, ij. So the first step here was, of course, to write everything in terms of velocities. So starting uh, from the usual Einstein-Hilbert action, just consisting of a, uh, the Ricci uh, scalar term, and then proceeding to re-express everything in terms of these new adapted um, phase-based variables. Now, the four-dimensional integral we write also as a, uh, we also decompose in a time part and a um, a spatial part. Now the expression that then appears here is pi ij hij dot. So that's my pq dot term in terms of the fields minus n curly h perp minus ni curly h i. Here, of course, the sum over i from one to three uh, is understood. And the Hamiltonian is just read off from this as a function, of course, of coordinates and momenta, but also these n and ni's as this <clears throat> three-dimensional integral over the hyper spatial hypersurfaces, which are called sigma d3x, n h perp plus and I, uh, H I. Now, you know, you realize I'm just giving you various algebraic expressions. Uh, I'm not presenting you the explicit algebra, although uh, uh, this is, you know, tedious but straightforward. What does that mean? The first time you do it, you are struggling, you know, trying to get find all the terms and get all the indices right. Uh, so that's also a warning to you. I mean, 
you have to have done some of these computations at some stage to appreciate just what's, what's going on and what are the uh, slight technical you know, issues involved when you do this. Now, these H, HI and HPERP were given as minus two covariant spatial derivative capital DJ pi IJ of X and the H perp. These were all expressions that were already on the board yesterday. I'll try and make an effort and distinguish case and kappa. So kappa squared um, of, uh, depend on the Newton constant. G I J K L is kind of a, a a metric on superspace. Superspace is the space of all uh, three-dimensional metrics. Pi ij, pi kl, minus square root h, divided by kappa squared, and a three-dimensional r. where I had defined this curly G, kind of a, a metametric, a supermetric, a metric on the space of metrics, um, as the following expression, 1 divided by 2 square root of determinant of H, H, I, K, H, J, L, plus H, J, K, H, I, L, minus H, I, J, H, KL. This is a bit uh, a metric. And we had already said, well, maybe this is not, you know, I can recognize this as vaguely as some kind of Hamiltonian. Uh, here is it, my kinetic term, some linear combination with index contractions of these symmetric uh, momentum tensors. And here is something like a, uh, a potential uh, energy. Now, what on earth these things are, well, that's at this stage a little unclear. However, now, looking at the form of the action, there's one thing uh, you immediately realize, namely it's, well, singular structure. Singular in the sense we had talked about in the context of these finite dimensional constraint systems. Because, of course, you see, although we introduced a canonically conjugate momenta to these ends, they were also constrained to be zero. So I haven't even included them here. That was, of course, a, a consequence of the fact that the time derivative of these variables never appeared in my action. Right. As a consequence, now, if I... Now, this is a, a, a classical expression. Of course, one thing I can do is just write down what equations of motion follow from this. I compute the when I compute now the uh, Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, of course, what I see is since this, with respect to the n and the ni's, derivatives do not appear, the Euler-Lagrange equations read partial derivative of L, Lagrange density, with respect to n, equal to zero. That immediately, of course, implies that whatever n multiplies in this function just has to vanish by the equation of motion. And the same holds when I vary with respect to ni. And of course, I immediately get an equation that these hi's have to vanish. OK, so these n and ni's are nothing but so-called Lagrange multipliers. right? And they enforce simply the vanishing uh, on shell of whatever mu is multiplied by them. Yeah, so that's our. Uh, first observation. Yeah. N and Ni of course they are of course arbitrary they depend on you know uh, their fields, so they depend of course on uh, the space-time points. So they enforce a couple of constraints. And the constraints are exactly 
three, well, there are three constraints. Hi, doesn't matter whether I write the index up or down, uh, equal to zero. This is called the diffeomorphism constraint, sometimes also called the momentum constraint. And h perp equal to zero is called the Hamiltonian constraint. So I think, I mean, momentum constraint refers to the fact that, you know, I, I might think of these things somehow vaguely as a four, as a four vector or something, then I have momenta and, and uh, Hamiltonian kind of energy. So this was fine. I mean, this looked like a Hamiltonian, but it's not quite a Hamiltonian. It's a Hamiltonian constraint. So it will be actually required to vanish on solutions of my theory. Okay, that's a little bit special. You know, think, like, oops, if I'm going to interpret this as an energy, you know, why, why should the energy vanish? All right. Now, uh, this turns out you know, to be a quite generic feature and can be traced back again to the invariances of the theory, which of course caused this system to be singular in the first place. Um, now, uh, of course we've learned now in our uh, finite dimensional analysis that we know now, if you have a bunch of constraints around, that it's important to understand what their Poisson bracket algebra is and, for example, to test whether we are talking about a first-class constraint system, because we ha have already learned something about what it means for the <coughs> physical degrees of freedom of the theory. And I will just quote, again, that a somewhat involved algebraic exercise to compute now the Poisson brackets of these objects. Now, this is, of course, realize it's a step up from what we did in finite dimensions, because if I now write down uh, you know, the Poisson brackets, they are field theoretic quantities. So the derivatives that appear are functional derivatives. So what I can already expect, if I just you know, take the, the brackets of these bare expressions, are Dirac delta functions typically appearing on the right-hand side. Yes. So let me just write on what the algebra is, and then let's think a little bit more of what uh, the meaning, what they tell us. Okay, so let us first look at the simplest case. That is the equal time Poisson brackets of two of these diffeomorphism constraints, hj i of x and hj uh, of x. Now, this becomes, on the right-hand side, an hj of x, partial derivative with index i. This is y, refers to the argument y here, yes. So, and also I should say, so these are all, this, this relation and the, the other ones I'm going to write down, they're equal time Poisson brackets. Now, this acts, the derivative acts on a three dimensional delta function of x and y, and then there's a second term plus hi of y del j x delta 3 x and y. Now, we have not just delta functions, we have even derivatives of delta functions on the right-hand side. Again, this is not surprising um, after the remark I just made. Uh, and now here, otherwise, the right-hand side is proportional to the constraints here I started with, namely the momentum constraints. We recognize this already as being something like a Lie algebra relation. 
but let me write down the two other relations first and then discuss this a little further. What is an hi of x? Poisson brackets with an h perp of y. That gives me a right-hand side of h perp of x, del i x, three-dimensional Dirac delta of x and y. And lastly, an h perp with an h perp gives me a right-hand side, which is hij, so my metric with indices raised, curly hi, momentum constraint of x, partial derivative with respect to y on three-dimensional Dirac delta. And there's another, there's a second term, minus h i j of y h i of y del j in direction of x again of the three dimensional delta function Now, this whole this set of expressions, I mean, the, the algebra that they generate goes by the name of Dirac algebra. If I want to get rid of these singular right-hand sides, um, and actually, it's a procedure that is strongly recommended in actual calculation is uh, to smear, as one says, smear out these phase space functions. And what I mean by this is to integrate them against kind of test functions. So, um, yeah, let me do it here. And it's perhaps easier if I just visually, if I just write these right below uh, them. So smeared out version of this smeared out version where you're using the following integrated expressions h perp. Now this doesn't then have an x argument, but kind of a functional dependence on the smearing function. Let me call this n, d3x, n of x, h of x. And similarly, for the other, the momentum constraint, let me integrate this over three dimen in three dimensions over a test function, which I call ni. So same symbol as a lapse and shift, hi of x. Yes, but I could use, in principle, other test functions. But this is, of course, exactly the ones that appear if I look at the integrated form of the Hamiltonian there. So they're, they're smeared with with functions which happen to have already this additional meaning. But in principle here, I might just choose any, any other functions. I mean, so this is independently uh, valid for what I'm going to write down now. Now, what does become of the algebra? Obviously, the right-hand sides will now be regular, right? So no more, no more delta functions or derivatives will appear because in de facto, I have added two integrations. Uh, now, what happens is that h of n 
i h of m j. So these are now two distinct smearing functions. Becomes an h of some new smearing function, capital K, index K, say, where this is a vector, like these were three vectors, the n and the m, so this k is also a three vector. And you obtain it by just taking the commutator of vector fields of the n and the m. And you can think of that, for example, as the lead derivative in the direction of vector field n of the vector field m. That's an aside. Now, what are the other two relations? Smeared out momentum constraint for some bracket with a smeared out Hamiltonian constraint gives me back a Hamiltonian constraint with a new smearing function. And now I have to tell you how this depends on the ni and the n on the left-hand side, m is lead derivative in the direction of vector n of the smearing function capital N. And that's the same. You write it out in coordinates. It's an n i l i n. This, of course, just being the partial uh, derivative. And lastly, my h perp smeared with n for song bracket h perp smeared with m gives me a h of a k i. So this now is a momentum constraint where ki is equal to little h i j n del j m minus m del j n. OK. Now, if everyone has written this down, let me just make some remarks about what this is. Yes? This one here? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Oh, it's just another smearing function. It's just this one where I have another smearing function, which I call m. Okay. So that's just, just keeping track that I have two different uh, constraints. Of course, you see, you should think of these you know, when I write down that diffeomorphism constraint, Hamiltonian constraint, of course, it's one for every space-time point x. So you really should, so we're talking about a field theory, you should, you should think that it's really an infinite set of constraints. And in the smeared out version, the way I'm keeping track of this would be to say, well, I'm running through all possible smearing functions with appropriate, well, whatever, fall of properties to make these integrals well-defined. Yes. Uh, so I said it again. The, the index i. Do we need to take the summation in the right hand side? Here. Yeah. No. This is look. This is uh, an example of a diffeomorphism constraint, which, which depends on a vectorial. Smearing field like here. Of course, it doesn't have a free index, but I'm indicating that it depends on the vector I've put in here, and which is, uh, however, contracted, of course, with the index on the HIs. Okay. Now, so the question, of course, what what on earth is this algebra? I mean, what does it? want to tell us, or maybe does not want to tell us. Okay. Now, 
the first relation. So th these are the three-dimensional diffeomorphisms. So that are, of course, our original theory in four dimensions before we introduced this three plus one split had a four-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance. Yes? Now, we've projected it in a three plus one fashion. Of course, what one's expectation would be is that it reduces on the three-dimensional slices just to the three-dimensional diffeomorphisms. And that expectation is indeed correct. So this is nothing but the Lie algebra of the three-dimensional diffeomorphism group on these hypersurfaces, capital sigma. Okay, and this is just the Lie algebra, and if I take the commutator of two of them, well, they relate, I mean, the arguments relate exactly as, as I would expect from the diffeomorphism algebra. Again, of course, the diffeomorphism group is an infinite dimensional group, and of course, its algebra is also infinite dimensional, and it's, it's spanned by all the vectors, right, the vector fields. So we understand what this is, right? So let me give this a star. So this star is just isomorphic. Uh, it's isomorphic with the Lie algebra. of the diffeomorphisms of these spatial hypersurfaces. Let me just call this diff of uh, sigma, whose generators are exactly the, these vector fields. So also the first thing we can look at the other relations is that this is a closed subalgebra of the Dirac algebra, right? Because momentum constraint with momentum constraint gives me another momentum constraint. So this, is, this closes on itself. So, and it's transparent what it means. Yes, so, um, now, is the rest here, so it's a Lie algebra, or it's isomorphic to a known Lie algebra with a clear geometric interpretation. What can I say for, for the rest here? Well, unfortunately, uh, this whole algebra taken together is not the Lie algebra of four-dimensional diffeomorphisms. There are various ways to see that, but one way is to see that, well, it's not actually Lie algebra. And why is it not a Lie algebra? Because here in this last relation, what appears are not just the arguments n and m, but explicitly what appears are the coordinates, part of the co phase space coordinates. So that is a case where, uh, well, so it's, it's, well, it's Lie algebra that is, still, uh, that is still fine, but it has structure uh, functions here. And if it were uh, structure constants, then it might have a chance of being uh, the four dimensional, the, the, the relation of the four dimensional diffeomorphism algebra, but this is not the case. These are different relations. And in particular, they bring in uh, a particular field dependence. Now, why are we not talking about the four-dimensional diffeomorphism algebra? Well, because we've introduced a split and we have introduced certain projections of, of the quantities we're playing around with. So this is an adapted uh, kind of structure where, uh, which is implicitly and explicitly depending on this slicing I've chosen. Yes, so it's not, so please keep this in mind. Uh, so the Dirac algebra the Dirac algebra um, is, well, it's not isomorphic, that would be the best way to say it, to uh, div. The four di original four dimensional uh, 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 manifold. Um, now, at the, at the risk uh, of again contradicting myself, of course, if it were Lie algebra, this would have to be constant. So, 
So it's linear, it's fine, it's linear on the right hand side. Yes? The F appears in curly H, and the curly H definition of curly H is that we integrate over all X. So the X dependence is gone when we have integrated. Yeah, yeah, no, the X dependence is here. I just wanted to indicate that it's a field. So the important thing is that is, this is one of the, the canonical variables. Yeah, yeah, you're right that the X dependence will disappear, but of course the, the H dependence will, will stay. Right. You know, never mind whether I integrate over this function or not. So this, this is the statement I wanted to make. So, uh, so it's not... So what I really wanted to say, so it's not even a Lie algebra, but of course what is still the case is that it closes in the sense of the first class condition, right? Namely, that all the right-hand sides are linear combinations of the constraints. So that is satisfied. So we have a first class constraint system, and what we can expect is that my infinite dimensional system will be, first of all, constrained to a submanifold of phase space of co-dimension for times infinity, because you know, we're talking about the field theory, plus these four constraints are also going to generate some kind of gauge transformations on my infinite dimensional phase space. So we will find exactly the same kind of geometric um, situation here at, at work uh, we saw in, 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 finite, uh, in finite dimensions. Okay, so here this means we have structure functions and not constants. And, well, to, you know, cut a long story already now somewhat short, uh, if you're trying now to implement this algebra um, in the quantum theory, this is what this gives you the least of problems, but the rest does. Uh, and it, in particular, this very specific dependence here, uh, say, on the, on the, on the HIJs. OK, before getting there, let me say a couple of other things. Um, first of all, of course, there are these constraints. But of course, there are still equations of motion I have to solve. Right. Now, there is a nice kind of a nifty little theorem that tells you the following, namely that if on every hypersurface of your theory the constraints are satisfied, I mean, as I've written them up there, so hi equal to zero and h perp equal to zero, then automatically also the equations of motion uh, um, uh, uh, are satisfied. So let me just write this down. Okay. Now that's a theorem if for a Lorentzian space time given in terms of M and just a four dimensional pseudo remaining metric G menu, we have that the constraints vanish, HI equal to zero, H perp equal to zero. On every one of the spatial hypersurface surfaces, Sigma, sigma t, I called them yesterday. Then this g mu nu line satisfies all. 10 Einstein equations. 
do mu nu equal to zero. I hope this is a no notation. That's the Einstein tensor consisting of r mu nu minus one half g mu nu r. So in that sense, you know, you, you could say, well, the dynamics is already contained in the constraints alone. And that is also the rationale uh, one follows in the quantum theory that at all costs one wants to, now, after one has translated, that is one the possibility, these into operator equations, one then looks for kind of wave functions that lie in the kernel, in the joint kernel of, of these constraints. So that is once, you know, one way of uh, saying, well, these are then the dynamical relations. My, my quantum well, Einstein equations, they are not Einstein equations, but, you know, classically, of course, we have this relation and something similar uh, you might expect to hold in the, in the quantum theory. Okay, let me finish here on this blackboard. Um, Why does it always go up with me? Let me finish with a little degree of, of, of freedom, freedom counting. Now I have identified that I'm talking about a first class system. Um, now I was starting with uh, pairs. H i j <coughs> pi i j. Now these constitute well six degrees of freedom in the sense of being six pairs of phase space variables. I mean six times infinity cube because I'm doing that for every, you know, every point X, spatial point X. Um, I have then the constraints. So I have first class constraints. And of those, I have four times infinity cube. So note here, here this refers again to pairs of degrees of freedom on the phase space. So before in this finite dimensional examples, I counted these as eight, eight uh, of course, eight directions in phase space. So, but here I'm just, I'm, I'm counting pairs. So the, the striking twice of the first class constraints has already been incorporated in this counting. And of course, this leaves me with two physical degrees of freedom. So these are my physical degrees of freedom. And uh, well, the, the counting works out, the counting of the number of what these are works out, of course, exactly like it did for the linearized gravity case. But of course, in the linearized gravity case, I had very explicitly identified what these were, you know, in, 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 in the sense of a polarization states of uh, just linear waves. Okay. But here, I haven't done anything of the kind yet, but I have already established that by simply counting degrees of freedom, following the Dirac Bergman algorithm in principle, I've reached, you know, at least to. Uh, to quantify how many of those uh, there are in my theory. Yes? Every, uh, yes. Four times uh, four uh, constraint equations, right? Yes. So shouldn't there be an eight? Oh. Yes. Well, yes. I could have written in my own counting, this should be twelve. phase space. Yes, it right. should be 12, uh, so and this should be eight, and then we would have four 
face-to-face degrees of freedom, but I can't, well, you know, one uses these two things uh, interchangeably, but often when, when one yeah, talks about degrees of freedom, one means just the kind of the configuration space degrees of freedom, or, or pairs of uh, face space degrees of freedom. So, yeah, so there's really no, uh, yeah, there's no issue here. It's just a different way of talking about uh, the same uh, thing. Now, once people had uncovered this algebra, of course, the question arises now, yeah, what, what, what is it? And especially, what is this H perk doing there? Um, well, you can read about this in many places. Certainly, again, I would say uh, Zundermeyer's book and references therein are, are, are a good reference. Now, geometrically, what this H perp does, I mean, the, the H eyes, right? They just generate diffeomorphisms in the spatial directions. I mean, so far, so transparently uh, understood. What these H perps do is they, uh, they move these spatial hypersurfaces, well, on shell, that, that is, on configurations that already solve all the constraints, perpendicular to itself. So it kind of create a little kind of bubble evolution, you could say. Uh, so this, this is the, uh, uh, so it's, it's, that's why one also calls it sometimes the, the hypersurface deformation algebra. And if you look in uh, Miesner, Thorn, Wheeler, I think they have so many ways of understanding this algebra. And then after, of course, the book was published, people have come up with so many other things of kind of restating and rephrasing uh, what this is and how, what are the minimal conditions to derive them. And essentially, these turn out to be well, just a shared symmetry group. So if you have really a theory that is invariant under diffeomorphisms, four-dimensional diffeomorphisms, and then you make a three plus one split like the one we had here, you will find an algebra isomorphic to that, with where then the H perps and then the H i's, of course, will then for any given case be different functions of the dynamical degrees of freedom. This could then also include, for example, matter fields of a certain kind. It doesn't affect the overall structure of that algebra, but what each individual constraint then is as a function of fields, that will then change uh, and depend on the theory. So this is essentially just dictated by the original symmetries of the theory, diffeomorphisms, plus my wish to squeeze it into a kind of a three plus one uh, kind of projected uh, version via this uh, preferred spatial uh, slicings. Um, and of course, you would say, if that is a structure you expect to recover in the quantum theory somehow, yeah, then maybe the same algebra should make an appearance because it would then also give rise, you know, it would induce a certain geometric interpretation of your quantum theory, which you might want to retain, or at least in some limit to retain. Um, okay, now I want to raise a few um, uh, general issues in the, when it comes to the quantization of systems, which are of the first class type, or in general just have some uh, redundancy, some gauge redundancy built in. And I want to do it by way of drawing a little, well, commutative, perhaps, diagram. So that's kind of the general issue I want to address in the remainder of today's lecture, quantizing constraint systems, comes with a bunch of kind of questions of principle, as well as questions of practicality. Um, now, what is my diagram? My diagram has four corners, so my upper left-hand corner is the classical, now unreduced theory. That means I have here a theory. It's given to me in terms of a, of a bunch of variables of which I already know that part of them are gauge and only part of them is genuine physical degrees of freedom. That's what I mean by unreduced. Um, There is a process 
in principle that says, okay, let me already classically just try and get rid of this redundancy and just rephrase everything in terms of a subset, subset of variables. Uh, and this I call then a classical reduction. So let me throw out all the, the superfluous you know, variables and arrive at some classical reduced theory. Now, this much for the classical side. Now, the issue arises, of course, I'm, I'm interested in the quantum theories. So, let me, for simplicity, again, think of that as a process where I now associate with this uh, a, a quantum theory. So, if I do this for the unreduced theory, then, so this is my quantization procedure, whatever it is. Let me leave this open for the moment. I arrive at a quantized, unreduced theory. And similarly, if I do the same here for my classically reduced system, I arrive at a reduced quantum theory. On the other hand, of course, I, you know, if I have the quantized reduced theory, uh, unreduced theory, uh, there's still too many degrees of freedom floating around. So somehow on the quantum side, I have also to get rid of this redundancy in some way. Let me not specify how. Let me call this the quantum mechanical reduction, whatever it is. And that should also then lead me to the bottom uh, right-hand corner. And of course, this is what I'm looking for, right? This is what I'm interested in. Quantum theory of my genuine physical degrees of freedom. And certainly one question that immediately poses itself is, uh, is that a commutative diagram, right? Do I get to the same theory if I go this way, right, this way, or that way? So are these two things equivalent? Should they commute in as a matter of principle? Um, or, or, or what? Um, well, to start with, well, I mean, any, any statement or many statements that people will make about this issue will already make some assumptions about, you know, what these arrows mean. Now, my general statement would be that a priori, it is... It doesn't seem to me given that, as a matter of principle, these two procedures should lead to the same result. Now, what I mean by this is, if I'm quantizing this system, I'm clearly talking about a system with more degrees of freedom that I'm quantizing and that potentially, of course, interact with my physical degrees of freedom. That's not the case here. Here they, well, they're just not there. So, for example, and of course, potentially, these other, you know, maybe, I don't really know what they do in the quantum theory. Do these other degrees of freedom kind of entirely decouple? In very simple cases, I can write down, they may seem to do this. But in general, who knows, right? They could have, I mean, the, the, the additional, the extra degrees of freedom I'm quantizing here might just have some kind of influence on my final quantum theory even if then I impose some, some reduction here. So it seems to me that as a matter of principle, uh, it's not clear that this should be commutative. Now, if you make more specifications about what these arrows mean, and you know, uh, well, then it might in the end well be commutative. Who knows? Now, practically, there are great limitations uh, on what you're actually able to say 
on the, about this question in concrete situations. Because, of course, unfortunately, for generic classical theories, we simply have no idea what this arrow is. We have more of an idea here if my original space was a vector space, you know, when I have a Fox space quantization. Okay, these are cases that I typically can handle. And if this is kind of sufficiently simple, after having reduced, very often I just have absolutely no clue what this arrow is. In addition, there is certainly in the same sense as, well, quantizations by themselves are not kind of unique one-to-one -one arrows. The way you implement a quantum mechanical reduction for surely is also not unique in general. What do you mean by that? So you see there are various pieces of this diagram are simply not very well defined. And for the case of gravitational theories, if you include this to mean you know, general theories which look similar, which are diffeomorphism invariant, maybe live not just in four, but in other dimensions, we are very limited. I mean, we, we, we can hardly do anything to get to, to here. And in four dimensions, actually, well, we haven't really got to here in a way that people uh, agree on. So these are just a few uh, uh, remarks to keep uh, in mind. Um, now, this is even more unpractical usually uh, because of the, the involved nature of physical phase spaces, reduced phase spaces. So the more practical way is usually this kind of this red arrow. Um, and what one then uh, uh, does is uh, going this red arrow. This means this quantum reduction process is usually taken to, to be something one calls uh, the Dirac quantization. So let me just write this down. So that's at least a popular way of implementing this reduction. What does this consist in? I still have five minutes to give you a sketch more about this uh, uh, tomorrow. First, one quantizes, that's a prescription, uh, quantizes, it's a kind of the redundant, I call it. I mean, gauge in the sense of gauge, presence of gauge degrees of freedom, uh, the redundant, unreduced theory on some Hilbert space. Space H. We're talking about canonical quantization, of course. Uh, so one, one pretends that this is just a physical theory and applies to it, you know, whatever quantization, standard quantization procedure is at hand. One then kind of implements the constraints on, on states. on states, and let me revert um, to my notation of constraints as classically as phi A, what we had yesterday. Then you'd say here, I'm projecting out states, a subspace of states from my Hilbert space, which satisfy a certain condition, so that will then give rise to a kind of a physical Hilbert space, namely if they are in the kernel, or as one also says, are annihilated by each one of the quantum, the quantized versions of these classical phase space functions. So that determines, hopefully, a sensible subspace of my Hilbert space for me for all constraints A. Yes? 
successful with compile, we can't implement such condition so we have to relax it a bit. Well, this usually works quite fine. I mean, in quantum mechanics, do I talk about, I'll probably I'll talk about this next time. I mean, you know, we had yesterday, we had kind of a condition that was P3 equal to zero classically. Just to give you an example of what happens. Right? Now, that was, my, that was my classical constraint. Now, how would this be translated to the quantum theory? It would say uh, phi hat, in this case, is equal to uh, pi 3 hat, simple Schrodinger quantization. And my condition on wave functions would then be p3 hat on psi that depends on, say, variables q1, q2, q3, something like this, is equal to 0. And this is, of course, proportional to d by d q3, this operator. And then it would just tell you, well, the physical wave functions are those which are constant or do not depend on q3. And then, of course, I have to see how I handle this within the set. These are not then a priori square integrable because, well, it, they could just be constant as a function of the, uh, of the third direction. So, and they have, but it's pretty straightforward what this means. I mean, I just will drop then this, this coordinate essentially from the physical as an argument of my, for my physical uh, wave function. So this is how this is to be understood. But clearly, yes, especially in, in field theory, additional consistency issues will arise. Uh, and this sometimes this is too strong a condition, indeed. Um, So what, certainly one consistency condition, I'll just mention briefly now. So recalling, of course, that what we had classically was phi A, for some bracket, with phi B equal to F A B C phi C. We must have that at the operator level, phi hat A and phi hat B imposed on wave functions also vanish. And unfortunately, well, why is it not immediately guaranteed? Of course, in general, I have to say something about what these constraints are. But a simple reason could be that, for example, if these here that themselves depended, uh, were functions and not constants, then, of course, they would also have to be quantized. So in a way, then these right-hand sides would become some you know, f hat a, b, c, phi, c. But when they're quantized, of course, a, an issue of operator ordering uh, comes up. So it might just be that when I do the computation of this commutator bracket, even if it's, well, reasonably well, if it's almost preserved, it might come out as something where the phi c happens to come out, say, on the left-hand side of these, uh, on the right-hand, the f's on the right, to the right of these quantized phi hats. And if I impose this condition then, right, if I impose this on my wave functions, of course, it's not covered by the fact that, you know, these annihilate them. But I would tend to get additional new conditions from where, you know, these functions annihilate the, the, the wave functions. Which means, unfortunately, that in general, I will be killing degrees of freedom uh, which are already physical. I mean, I'm over-constraining my system, certainly compared naively to what happens classically. So we can already see that many new issues will arise when I you know, try to now translate what I did classically for these constraint systems to the, to the quantum theory. <laughs>
and we'll meet more of these things later. I mean, there are, of course, very simple examples where everything kind of decouples, kind of the gauge degrees of freedom from the physical ones, for instance, like here, uh, where this goes through without problems. But of course, these are just very simple finite dimensional toy examples, and they're usually uh, the real case we are interested in physically is, is much more difficult. Yes? Uh, so, I have a question. If you want to go the other way. This way here. Say, yeah, so yeah. say we uh, say an example of 3D. If we fix gauge before, yes. uh, before we quantize, yes. will, will we not get something that's physically different than the QED that we don't fix? What would you think? Well, no, no, I mean, if I gauge fix consistently, of course, the final result ought not to depend on it. Okay. Of course, what also tends to happen, you see, of course, and what would have has hap to happen when you do this, say, in QED, you'll have to destroy other nice aspects of the theory, like explicit Lorentz invariance, or sometimes even something like locality. That doesn't necessarily mean you're, you know, everything is completely going wrong or even wrong at all, but it just, you know, other nice kind of manifest properties of your theory might, might get lost. Of course, you can still then get the correct, I mean, physical answers, I mean, the, but it's just not as, as, as obvious and it makes it more difficult to, to calculate. And nasty things like, you know, non-local expressions popping up. Uh, this is kind of a, one of the troubles you, you then meet in the explicit calculation and which may discourage you from going this way. Uh, again, you know, like electromagnetism is still, re is still a reasonably simple theory, but when it then comes to gravitational theories, I mean, this is not, yeah, th this is so, so nonlinear that it, it's not very promising. I mean, you, you can't really do very much here. Okay, see you tomorrow.